This is a limited series of the Rational Reminder podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making focused on cryptocurrencies. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, portfolio managers at PWL Capital. And welcome to episode four of this special series, incredible number four already. And this week we spoke with Professor Tobin Hanspal, who is an assistant professor of finance at VU, Vienna University of Economics and Business. He's also associated with the Vienna Grad School of Finance. Uh, so we talked to Tobin about the paper that I mentioned, which is the characteristics and portfolio behavior of Bitcoin investors, evidence from indirect cryptocurrency investments. Uh, a lot of Tobin's research, uh, like along with his co-authors, is focused on household finance. Uh, it's this idea of taking detailed data sets, like really detailed, and we we kind of get into that in the mm-hmm. in the episode uh, to examine the behavior of investors. P- people may remember in in our recent uh, episode on dividend irrelevance, one of the papers that we talked about was uh, another one of Tobin's paper papers where you, where you can look at the uh, specific interaction of like when a dividend is paid and then what is spent out of the individual's bank account. So that's the level of detail that they go into to to look at investor behaviors similar to this uh, to this crypto paper. Um, so it's, it's really looking at what are, this paper is really looking at, what are the individual characteristics and uh, investment behaviors of people who were in the end uh, cryptocurrency adopters in their portfolios? It's incredible just to have is, that data. It's incredible. It is, it is. And it's cool because now, to, to be clear, they were using uh, crypto products, like structured products from a bank, so not like on-chain transactions. And we talked to Tobin a little bit about uh, whether that's a good proxy or, or mm-hmm. not in the in the episode. Um, but the reason that we care about this is that there are no firm-based asset pricing models to help us think about the expected returns of crypto. Um, but there's this new, new-ish field of, of study called demand system asset pricing. Uh, and it's kind of what we talked to Sebastian Batermier about uh, in episode 196. Um, it, but it's it, it's like who who owns the assets? Where where's the demand for the assets coming from? And we know from the Batermi episode that the age and wealth factors uh, price assets just as well as the Fama French five factor firm based uh, characteristics model. Um, so the idea here is that if we if we know that a, a a certain type of investor owns a certain type of stock and those stocks have low expected returns. If that same type of investor also wants to own cryptocurrencies, it may imply that cryptocurrencies have a similar expected return uh, profile. So mm-hmm. like in the Sebastian Batermi example, uh, we know that the, uh, empirically that high beta, small cap, low profitability, high investment stocks with high turnover and low institutional ownership are favored by younger and less wealthy investors and also by investors who are prone to sentiment. And then we also know those types of stocks have low expected returns and extreme skewness in their returns, uh, or, or like the lottery-like characteristics, same as kind of what we talked about with uh, the thematic uh, ETF example. Now, from a demand asset pricing perspective, if we know that it's the same type of investor that wants to own lottery stocks, uh, also wants to invest in in crypto, that's again where we get some potential insight into what is pricing crypto assets. From a from a demand system perspective, mm-hmm. uh, so I, I think it's I think it's pretty interesting um, to think about, uh, and I also think that Tobin's paper builds on what we talked to Igor Makarov about, where we know that a lot of transaction volume in crypto can be attributed to speculation, like a huge portion of the transaction volume, um, and then if we can also think about that in the context of who are the investors and what are their characteristics and how does that re- how does that relate to uh, the expected returns on a stock portfolio that that type of investor would also favor. Uh, I think it starts to get pretty interesting pretty quickly. Uh, and then we also talked to Tobin about two behavioral finance studies that he's done uh, based on stock market investors in that case. But I think that they're both very relevant to crypto. Um, and we did put the results of those papers into a crypto context in our conversation with Tobin. Uh, one of those papers finds that optimistic beliefs lead to both a higher allocation of wealth to risky assets and a higher incidence of the disposition effect, which is the tendency to sell uh, winners and hold on to losers. Uh, And then the other paper we talked about, uh, this one I think is especially relevant right now, uh, right now being with the recent volatility in the crypto market, 
Uh, that paper finds that after taking losses on risky assets, uh, people tend to avoid taking risk altogether or, or significantly reduce their future risk taking. Uh, in that case, they used a sample of investors who owned bank stocks that defaulted in the financial crisis. Uh, but I think it's it's hard not to see parallels in, in crypto today. Wow, what a setup. It's incredible. So shall we go to the interview? Yeah, I think let's go ahead to the interview with Tobin. This is a, I think we've had a, a few very interesting conversations. This one's a, it, it's taking a different perspective. Uh Maybe sort of similar-ish to what we talked to Igor about, but it's really getting into who's involved in this thing and what does that tell us about the expected returns in the space. Cool. Well, here's our conversation with Professor Tobin Hansbaugh. Tobin Hansbaugh, welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Tobin, cryptocurrencies are anonymous or, or pseudonymous. Uh, how did you manage to investigate the investment behavior of early crypto adopters? Yeah, so so there's a number of studies and there's a lot of interest about asking, you know, what type of investors are trading cryptocurrencies and who are cryptocurrency investors. But obviously the major challenge is that it's basically impossible to look at the, you know, detailed investment characteristics of these individuals or like their their actual trading behavior because um, exactly as you said, most cryptocurrencies are are basically anonymous or or partially anonymous at least. Um so, you know, if you want to look at individuals' portfolios and equities, you generally can partner with a bank or a brokerage and use anonymized trading histories to kind of construct some sort of analysis about what investors are doing. With crypto, this is obviously a bit more challenging, and I think uh, researchers have to be a little bit creative. Um, you know, you might be interested in aggregate flows and so on, but this doesn't tell us much about detailed investor choices and behavior. We could also field surveys and ask subjects directly questions related to crypto. But um, of course, this leaves us limited in other dimensions. So, so what we actually did was we worked with a brokerage in Germany and we looked at trading data and records on uh, cryptocurrency related structured retail products. Um, so, so we basically scanned their you know, their investors and picked out the ones that were holding these, uh, these related products. And, you know, you can refer to these as in many different names or different ways. These, these are generally structured retail products or tracker certificates, index certificates, or various types of derivatives. Um, we, we kind of refer to these as indirect uh, cryptocurrency investments. And there's actually a couple of benefits for using these um, to proxy for cryptocurrency investments. So on one hand, we observe the entire portfolio of the investor, uh, and we can investigate different investment biases. And if these investors are using other types of asset classes and other types of financial innovations, and also these investors are already customers of this brokerage when these products were introduced. So we have less of a selection issue where investors may be joining specific brokerage houses uh. to trade in uh, specific assets. So go ahead if you wanted to interrupt or... No, it's fascinating. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. So, so these indirect crypto products, um, they're basically issued by banks and offer retail clients. I mean, in our setting in Europe, of course, but um, you know, these are available in a number of markets. They, they give investors the opportunity to, to basically track the price path or volatility of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, so these are not unique to the German market. I think we have Bitcoin future ETFs in, in various settings. And I think it, it, in the Toronto Stock Exchange, you actually have an actual BT, uh, mm. Bitcoin ETF for the last couple of months now, right? Yep. So we had this partnership with this large online brokerage in Germany, and we accessed the transaction records and monthly holdings for a sample of investors for a relatively long horizon. We've had this ongoing relationship. So this is 2003 until 2017. Um, now, these indirect cryptocurrency products were basically introduced as early as 2014, but really became, uh, you know, traded actively in the, um, you know, the price developments at, towards the end of 2017. So 2016 and 17 are basically the key time frame of our setting here. And what we can do is we can look at the investors that hold such assets and compare them to kind of the average retail investor that's not holding them. And since we have this time series, 
we can try to see what happens um, you know, before investors start purchasing these assets and what happens after, basically. Mm. It's, a, it's a really smart way to, to solve the problem. D do you think that, that indirect crypto investments are a good proxy for crypto investors in general who would be maybe accessing it right on the blockchain? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is like a, a nuanced question, right? So, so, I mean, like a proxy is exactly that. There's obviously going to be some noise when we try to extrapolate a lot from these types of investors. And, you know, I think it depends. Um, but in general, it's not a terrible proxy, right? So I think, uh, I think I so I would argue that it's probably the best we have in terms of painting a picture of investors who are interested in cryptocurrencies. And I also think that there are different types of crypto uh, cryptocurrency investors. It's like, you know, we can't really put all of them in one box and say, this is a cryptocurrency investor, right? We have the type of investors who are really into the crypto scene. Um, they're well-versed in crypto since the very early days. They use it not only as an investment, but also as a way of an ex exchange potentially. Um, these are the investors or individuals who are probably really into things like Web3 and, and all of the blockchain related technology and innovation today. I don't think that tracker certificates or ETFs are a great proxy for these types of investors. Yeah. Um, those, those, those individuals are, are almost surely holding cryptocurrencies directly outside of traditional brokerage accounts. But I, I, I do think it's a pretty good proxy for the type of investors who are not these advanced heavy users, but traditional retail investors who are interested in, in gaining some crypto exposure. Um, without necessarily getting heavily involved, learning a whole new set of technologies. Um, you know, investing in a tracker certificate for many is an easy and relatively low effort or low risk way to test the waters with cryptos. Uh, you can get exposure to the price path and volatility uh, without setting up and funding a wallet, you know, and learning a whole completely set new of platforms or, or mobile apps and so on. The last thing I want to say here is I also think that uh, this is a very important and growing segment of the market, right? So if you think about bringing Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies to the masses, I think these types of investors are are actually the early adapters that we would precisely be interested in. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point because mo e even on mass adoption, you wouldn't necessarily expect everybody to get to the point where they're comfortable setting up a, a wallet and going through all that and managing their keys. I mean, if you think about retail investors, I mean, you obviously have a group of retail investors, you know, outside of cryptocurrencies that are, um, you know, doing he heavy amounts of fundamental research and so on. And these are, you know, these are the, the, the tail shareholders. Right. And then you have the ones that are, are not, right? They just want some exposure to the S&P 500 or, mm. or um, you know, Tesla or something. And, and I think it's important to, mm. to look at both these types of groups. So you have data pre and post crypto adoption. So pre adoption, how do the individual characteristics of crypto adopters compare to the non adopters? Yeah, they are quite different. So cryptocurrency investors have, uh, you know, significantly more assets under management at this brokerage than the non-cryptocurrency investors in the sample. Hmm. It's about 50% uh, larger. So we're looking at the average portfolio is, is 75,000 versus 50,000. Hmm. They also report basically twice the average monthly income. So these guys are, are, are generally well off. And uh, I, I'm often referring to them as guys, which is not sexist, but but by and large, these are men. Uh, so there's 90% men are cryptocurrency investors, and that's compared to the baseline share of um, non-cryptocurrency investors of uh, about 76% male. They're about the same age, a tiny bit younger. On average, it's about 47 years old versus 48 years, so there's not really a big difference there. And, uh, you know, I think also quite important is in contrast to the average retail investor where we tend to think about in, in at least in academic studies, cryptocurrency investors are way more active traders. So they're investing about, they're making about nine to 10 trades a month compared to about two from the non-crypto sample. Uh, and they're actually 
actively checking their, their kind of portfolio very often. They're logging into their brokerage account almost 90 times a month, which is, um, is, is, is it's a pretty heavy user and doesn't really sound like, you know, the average passive buy and hold investor. I- and, and, and that's, I think the, the important part there is this is before they've invested in crypto. So these are people who will, will go on to invest in crypto, but you're observing them before they do that. I think that's a, it's just fascinating. Um, how, how do the, you mentioned how frequently they're trading and logging in. How do the portfolios of the eventual crypto adopters compare to the non-adopters? Yeah, even even before they they differ dramatically, right? So, so cryptocurrency investors, um, are much more likely to hold single stocks rather than funds. They also hold funds which generally are associated with a higher risk capacity, such as different types of equity derivatives and warrants. On average, they hold, I think, 15 or 16 unique securities compared to about seven from the average sample investors. And and they also kind of tilt their portfolios from a values-weighted sense more heavily into these riskier uh, security. So they hold about 70% of their portfolios in, in um, some sort of risky asset relative to cash compared to about 50% of the average portfolio. And when it comes down to the actual crypto investments, um, on average, these investors hold about 4,000 euros in cryptos across two to three unique assets. But there is a very large standard deviation here. And some investors are holding obviously significantly more. So, so they're holding pre-crypto adoption. They're holding more risky assets. What about other stuff like uh, like like sector ETFs or you know thematic ETFs and that kind of thing? Yeah. So, um, so these investors are also more likely to uh, you know. So previously, they were more likely to invest in sector t- ETFs about three times. They were one and a half times more likely to invest in commodity ETFs. And then these were obviously um, several years ago when these were introduced as well. Mm -hmm. And we kind of we kind of mapped this towards being, um, you know, a little bit eager to try out new financial products and also a bit tech savvy in the sense. Right. So. Um, our hypothesis was that these crypto inver- investors are, are exactly that more interested in, in new financial products and tech savvy. So we found that these investors are about three times more likely to use the brokerage mobile app as opposed to the online portal. Um, in one area where they differ is when it comes down to robo advice. So robo advice, we kind of also think about as a kind of a new technology offering. Uh, crypto investors are, are not using it, however, which goes hand in hand basically with our theory that these investors are actually super active and they're not these passive delegators, which may um, be more <laughs> interested in using savings plans or different types of robo advice. So was there a big difference between the crypto and non-crypto investors in terms of you know, the typical investor behavior biases? Yeah. So this is a good question. So we thought there might be, given how active these guys are. Um, so we looked at a couple of different outcomes. We found that crypto investors are generally about three times more likely to chase trends and purchase stocks with recent um, kind of high performance. These investors seem to be drawn to um, yeah these these kind of recent. Uh, peak performance products. They're kind of following a momentum strategy. At the same time, crypto investors seem to be trading um, single stocks, which carry also high media sentiment relative to other stocks. So it seems like uh, crypto investors are are drawn to these trending stocks, which are talked about in the media or maybe even among um, other active traders on different kind of web portals and so on. In general, they're also about three times more likely to trade penny stocks and twice as likely to buy stocks that have lottery-like characteristics. These lottery-like stocks, um, you're probably well familiar with them, but they're characterized by low prices and high historical volatility. Uh, We're generally interested in these types of securities in academic studies, not only because they resemble gambling or trading um, trading for entertainment, but also 
you know, more recently, there's been some evidence that they carry a much higher risk for being featured in like pump and dump schemes, which I think um, is very interesting and relevant when it comes to crypto and some of like the tail end of, um, you know, coins, which were offered towards 2017, for sure. It's unreal. It's like, it's like crypto is just an extension of what they were already doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, the last thing we wanted to check there, like in terms of biases, I mean, this isn't a bias per se, but we wanted to see if these investors would consider themselves as chartists or, or technical traders. Um, yeah, as I said, it's not exactly a bias. And there is some evidence that technical trading for cryptocurrencies may have some value given the kind of nature of the ambiguous nature of the fundamentals. Uh, but I think the evidence for equities is, is pretty negative on technical trading. Um, it does seem that when they make purchases for single stocks, they, they are following, or they're more likely at least to follow, to follow moving average um, indicators. So this was like another thing that we thought was, was a potential um, red flag. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. And that, again, that was in stocks. So you mentioned that there's maybe some evidence that works a bit in crypto. It doesn't work in stocks, but these guys were doing it in, in stocks. Exactly. Hmm. D d does their behavior change after they've made their first crypto investment? Yeah, we, we believe that it does. I mean, we have to be a little bit cautious here, but um, in order to examine this as clearly po as possible, what we did was we took our cryptocurrency inv investors and then we did a matching exercise where we tried to kind of reduce any bias, which would come at least from observable characteristics. So we matched these investors to non-crypto investors based on um, age, gender, uh, tenure with the brokerage, geographic location, and so on and so forth. And then we basically... Um, we just look at the time series at how these investors change behavior or, or keep the same behavior uh, from before to after their first uh, crypto purchase. So we find that crypto investors who, again, are already very active in managing their portfolio become even more active after their first purchase. So they start to log into their account even more often. Uh, and the number of average monthly logins increases um, by about seven on average. So like an additional seven to 10 times uh, more logins every month. They also trade more often. Um, they increase the number of assets in their portfolio by adding more non-crypto securities as well. And what's really interesting is that they seem to increase their portfolio concentration in these riskier assets. So they're buying more penny stocks and more stocks with high skew and high volatility. And actually they're buying less ETFs. So we're not considering a crypto ETF in this case, but they're, they're buying less kind of uh, uh, passive ETFs. So within the crypto adopters, is there, or are there differences between the early adopters and the later adopters? Yeah, th there are. So. We don't have a massive sample here. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively small segment of the, of the investor population, but our study does allow us to say a little bit about this. We, what we can do is we compare the first and the last quartile of cryptocurrency investors in terms of their adoption time. Uh, so we compare the earliest to the latest, and we find that the earliest actually are even more active. So they, um, they make about 13 trades on average per month compared to about six, and they log in even more often. They log into their account 115 times compared to about 60. Uh, and they also um, have a higher participation rate in risky products such as um, other types of derivatives. So 61% of them are holding other derivatives compared to about 40% for the the later adopters, um, you know, so even the later ones that we pick up here are significantly different from the average sample investor. Let's let's not forget that. Uh, it could be that we're eventually converging to the average investor, but but it doesn't seem like this is happening super quick. Um, it does seem that the super early adopters are the ones that are. The, the most different from, from the average investor. You mentioned location earlier. Did you learn anything 
of interest there? Not really. Um, you know, we didn't plot these investors by specifically where they live. We're basically just using the geographic dimension as a control variable to make sure that we're not picking up uh, big differences from, let's say, city folk and uh, investors that live out in the country or something like that. But but that's interesting. I mean, it's it's a definitely a dimension that uh, could be explored further. So, so you mentioned they're adding crypto to their portfolios and adding other other high ski risky <clears throat> assets. What percentage of their portfolios are the crypto adopters allocating to crypto? Yeah. So the the average uh, is about ten to fifteen percent of their portfolio, which is 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 definitely not nothing. Uh, but this varies quite a bit. I think the top of the distribution looks more like thirty five to forty percent of their portfolio held in these assets. So. Definitely, um, yeah, definitely room to, to learn about cryptocurrencies for these wow, yeah. investors, yeah. And did the crypto investors reduce the riskiness in the rest of their portfolios to compensate for the addition of the crypto? Yeah, I mean, we would hope so, but, but that's not the case. Um, investors don't do that at all in our setting. Instead of basically rebalancing their portfolios to compensate for this additional risk, they tend to do precisely the opposite, and and um, you know, as I mentioned, wow. based on after their first cryptocurrency investor, they seem to kind of go all in and invest in in other riskier assets as well, such as penny stocks and these high vol or or other lottery like assets. So, not really, not at all. <laughs> what what do you think explains that? Like, why would the risk seeking behavior increase after a crypto investment? Yeah, it's a good question. So. You know, I was thinking that that maybe maybe there's some mental accounting going on. So mm. these investors are are potentially compartmentalizing these assets as, as a separate separate thing and not really thinking about the entire portfolio. Um, it could also be that they're just drawn to the entertainment value of this high volatility or or the gambling nature of these assets and. Um, you know, once they start, they they just want to kind of push it even further. Hmm. We, we know from other from other research that the individual investors tend to build inefficient portfolios relative to like a benchmark index. Is there a difference between the crypto and non crypto investors in terms of efficiency? Yeah, I mean, we looked at this a little bit uh, early on, and I think we ended up delegating it to an online appendix because the paper became relatively bulky. Um, and this wasn't really our contribution. But if I recall, uh, crypto investors on average did a tiny fraction of an amount better than the average investor. Um, but it, I think I would suggest that it probably all came from chance and, and potentially from being invested in a larger set of assets and not at all coming from, you know, these cryptocurrency investments, for example. Um, yeah, but I mean, I would definitely agree that these um, uh, retail investors tend to be pretty far from the benchmark in general in our setting as well. So looking back on this work, how would you, how would you describe the typical crypto investor in the study? Yeah, so um, yeah, I think, I think that these are retail investors who are a little bit savvy and perhaps very eager, as I said, to test out new and innovative financial products. They're not necessarily experts, um, but they don't necessarily need to be or want to be, right? So they, they learn about things like cryptocurrencies relatively early, and then they use these vehicles to gain some exposure to cryptos. Now, it is beneficial for those investors. That's a, that's a different story, right? So, so gaining some exposure to cryptocurrencies may be absolutely rational and completely right for these investors. Uh, they're not necessarily low wealth. They're not low income. They're not retirees. Um, but you know, I also think about a number of recent other studies which have shown things that like you know, structured retail products, yield enhancing products, thematic ETFs, and so on, are all very costly and on average underperform for the vast majority of investors. Uh, they're likely also even constructed to capitalize precisely on such a 
such a type of investor base, which is really eager to, to try these things out. So, so, I mean, I would say the welfare analysis isn't really solidified yet. Our data gives us an early look at who's buying these assets, um, but, it, but it would be great to do the next analysis, which tells us, uh, you know, how do these investors end up over time? Um, you know, what happens if they experience kind of volatility and large price, price drops and, and so on and so forth, right? Hmm. We, we we covered thematic ETFs in a recent podcast episode where I think it was like the the back tests always had positive five factor alphas, but post launch of the live fund they all had negative five factor alphas, big negative alphas. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean this is probably coming from this new working paper from from Zahi Ben David. And, That's the one. Yeah, exactly. I I'm a big fan of that paper, and uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a good paper. Uh, so I I want to switch into a couple of the other papers, uh, not directly related to cryptocurrency, but I think that they're, they're still interesting on this topic. Uh, you've got a paper on the disposition effect, which is the tendency to sell winning, winning stocks too early and, and hold on to losers too long. And I think that's really relevant in crypto where the market is exceptionally volatile. How do the beliefs that people hold about expected returns affect the incidence of the disposition effect? Yeah. So, so this study is um, this is actually from Denmark. So, so what we do is we measure investors' risk attitudes and expectations on the stock market in a controlled experimental laboratory setting, and then we relate these measures to portfolio characteristics, portfolio choices, and and eventually biases um, that these investors make in in the real world. So, what they make in the field after the experiment takes place. And what we find in general is that investors who are more optimistic on the market as a whole seem to be more likely to exhibit the disposition effect in their trades in the future relative to other active investors who are a bit more pessimistic. Um, and when I talk about the market as a whole here, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Denmark. So we're talking about the OMX uh, Copenhagen 20. But, but what we find is essentially that this relationship between individuals, investors' beliefs and the incidents or, or their propensity to have the disposition effect in the future is, is fairly nonlinear. So the incidence of the disposition effect is increasing at, at low optimistic levels and begins to decrease as expected returns on the market increase to very high levels. So once that expected return on the market reaches you know 25% or so, then the incidence of the disposition effect starts to trend downward because there's no um, there's no not really a reason to to uh, to to sell off um, stocks when you think that the the market is going to return an additional twenty five percent. What's interesting is that these kind of uh, empirical findings which we document are actually in line with previous theoretical models of the disposition effect which focus heavily on, on like prospect theory and other preference-based explanations. Um, so I would say our paper fits in alongside these in that uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to extend the belief side of the picture and not just look at preferences to understand how expectations may play a role in uh, investors' choices and, and ultimately in, in the bias, biases that, that we observe. Fascinating. Is risk appetite related to the disposition effect? Yeah, so we actually find a very limited correlation between the measures of risk which we elicited among investors and their incidence of the disposition effect in the field. On the other hand, it's very difficult to pin down precisely what is driving the incidence of the disposition effect, right? So most of the research to date, as I mentioned, has really focused on on risk on investor preferences so differences in risk appetite loss aversion other risk stories basically and and only recently have we started thinking about kind of heterogeneous beliefs so what we did was we we really spent a lot of try, time trying to ensure that we are adequately controlling for differences in risk attitudes uh, we're using different kind of structural utility uh, measures of, of different types of risk preferences and so on and so forth. But, but honestly, no matter what we did, um, we, we couldn't really uh, break the correlation between beliefs and the disposition effect and, and risk attitudes 
didn't really seem to add too much to that analysis. So, so basically, we find that 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 correlation between risk and uh, and the disposition effect is is relatively minor. Hmm. Are, are are the beliefs that people hold about expected returns affected by their past realized expected returns? Yeah. So this is this is important. Um, so so generally, investors form beliefs in our setting based on various attributes of their past returns and portfolio experiences. We looked not at not only at the mean expected return, but also at that in the variance. Um, in general, we found that the variance of expected returns didn't vary dramatically based on uh, different past returns or, or different portfolio attributes, but the mean varied uh, significantly. So expected returns was affected by individuals' past returns, both um, you know realized gains as well as paper gains. So higher portfolio returns led to more optimistic beliefs and kind of worse returns led to more pessimistic beliefs. When it comes to looking at kind of paper gains versus paper losses, we found a pretty large effect of paper gains affecting uh, future beliefs, but actually paper losses didn't really seem to have an effect. Um, and what that suggests to us is, is if, you're ha- if you have this unrealized loss, uh, you might not be really updating your beliefs based on it yet. You're, you might be kind of ignoring it to some extent. Um, and you know, it doesn't have an effect yet on your expectations of the future, which kind of fits well into our study on the disposition effect and actually shares some similarities with previous experimental work, which has shown that um, you know, if, you're, if your expectations or when the outcome doesn't really line up with what you expected it to do, you're not going to adequately update for the future. And thus you have this uh, tendency to then um, you know, have this paper loss, which causes investors to ignore that information, which would then kind of continue propagating the disposition effect because you wouldn't be um, you know, updating based on, on this paper, paper loss. This, these insights are absolutely fascinating. So do, do positive and negative realized past return experiences have the same effect on beliefs? Yeah, I think we found that um, you know r- realized gains had a strong effect on on um, on optimism, but past returns had had it, there was an effect, but it was less of an effect. So, mm. so I think that's basically what we found. So, so realized gain realized gains were were creating this optimism optimism in individuals' beliefs, whereas um, whereas realized losses had had to some extent this effect, but, but not as much, not nearly as much. Interesting. Okay. So that, that was paper losses have pretty much no effect. Realized losses have some effect, but still a weaker effect. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. And I just want to reiterate for, for listeners, when we're talking about expected returns in this case, we're literally talking about the returns that the individual investors expect to earn on their investments. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, we, we talk about expected returns a lot, but we're usually talking about discount rates and this is kind of, kind of different. Um, do, do the beliefs that people hold affect how much they allocate to risky assets? Yeah, um, so so they do, and actually, we're happy to to find that um, individuals' belief actually matter for how they allocate their wealth, right? So, if they didn't, we would we would question our measures of of beliefs. Um, but we indeed find a pretty strong positive cor- correlation, um, and and a number of previous work is also used, I think, surveys to, to document another correlation or a similar correlation. We find basically investors, um, they allocate about five percentage points more of their financial wealth to risky assets uh, if their expected returns increase by 10%. So if you were to look at a sample of pessimists and optimists, you would see, you know, a pretty large wedge in the overall fraction of wealth they had devoted to to risky assets. I should also note that the average kind of risk share of the investor in our 
in our sample is about 35%. So a five percentage point effect um, is, is definitely economically important. Uh, so to switch to one one other paper, which is another fantastic one, you've done some some really cool cool stuff on the at the household level. Uh, how, how do people that get burned by bad outcomes and risky investments change their future behavior? Yeah, so so thanks for asking about this paper. I like this one a lot. I mean, I like all of them, but this one I think is very very interesting. Um, so so. It, it, and more, more importantly, experience and experience effects, and and um, people getting burned and and updating their future behavior, I think is just is just so relevant and so important for retail investors and households. Um, so a number of a number of studies have previously shown that there are these very long run cohort level effects which are drawn from formative experiences. So. The, the best known one is, is obviously investors from the area, era of the Great Depression much later on in life tend to hold a lower fraction of their wealth in risky assets, and they tend to participate in um, you know, financial markets at a, at a much lower rate. But one question which comes up from this is actually how important is the degree to which you experience something? And how, how important is that degree related to future financial risk taking? Are these basically these large shocks enough to change behavior? Or is it actually that the ones that react and kind of shy away from risk taking, the ones that were more closely affected during that time? Um, you know, so to try to say something about this, we fielded this research study in Denmark. So, so I did my PhD in, in Denmark. That's why I have uh, all these studies from Denmark. But um, we have a very interesting setting in Denmark. That's why this is uh, super interesting. But basically, prior to the great financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, we saw many households in Denmark holding sizable investments in the shares of their own link, local bank stocks. These banks are, are regional, but, but publicly held, uh, and households were actually encouraged to invest uh, a relatively large amount of their long-term savings directly in these assets to capitalize on yeah, higher expected returns or, or kind of the boom market at the time. As the crisis evolved and kind of spread to, to Europe and to Germany, uh, sorry, to Denmark, um, a number of these banks actually became distressed and many then defaulted. So for households, their savings and deposits as, as bank customers were, were guaranteed and insured, but any investments that they had in these risky assets, like in the bank stock directly, incurred major losses. Actually, so, so these inv investments, mostly, if not all of them, effectively went to zero. And because of that, we can't really say how their um, financial wealth allocation to risky assets is affected because you have this mechanical effect of, of losing this, this wealth shock, right? So what we did was we looked at this subsample of investors who are also uh, making inheritance decisions at the same time. So these investors um, held these securities at the bank and um, you know, for completely unrelated reasons are inheriting a portfolio from a deceased parent or relative. Uh, of course, this, this subsample and this cross section of the number of investors who have this experience and the ones that are also inheriting, inheriting is quite small but uh, the, the benefit of these types of studies from, from Denmark is you actually have the universe of Danish investors at your disposal. As a, as a researcher, you work with um, you know, Statistics Denmark and you can observe you know, basically everyone. So the sample size is, is definitely large enough. So, so just kind of getting to the main point, what we do here is we look at this subsample of investors who are making inheritance decisions. And what we find is that those who have this firsthand experience, the ones that are actually getting burned and losing these investments in their bank stocks, are much more likely to take these inheritances of risky assets and liquidate them to cash. They are basically selling the risky assets off and holding the cash. Um, and what we, what we observe is that these investors are basically reducing their risk-taking 
And the effect size is about 10 percentage points relative to other investors who are making inheritance decisions who did not have this firsthand experience of, of losing investments in their bank stocks. Um, one thing that's really nice about the setting is that we can see what would happen to these investors had they inherited shortly before they made the experience. So um, there's investors who haven't yet experienced the bank shock, but are still inheriting you know, some months or a year before the financial crisis. Basically, these investors make absolutely no changes to the inherited portfolio. They, they're very comfortable holding the risky assets. It's really only the investors that make these firsthand personal experiences, which causes them to actively sell off these inheritances of risky assets, and, and they prefer to hold cash. Wow, so once burned, twice shy. Yeah, exactly. Incredible. And do the, do the experiences of peers or relatives have a similar effect? Yeah, so I think this is really important, right? So we find that the degree of how closely you make this experience is critical for affecting your future risk-taking. The peers or neighbors or relatives of those with the first-hand experiences don't really change behavior at all. There's some kind of minor rebalancing here and there, but it really seems that the investors that put their hand in the fire are the ones that then really jump back and, and kind of turn down their risk taking. Hmm. What, what do you think causes the reduced risk taking of the, of the people who've had these bad experiences? Yeah. So, so in our setting and, you know, in related papers, I think we can partially at least attribute the change in risk taking to, to basically a reduction in trust in financial markets. In our setting, financial advisors essentially violated fiduciary duty by encouraging these households or these, these novice investors most likely to take undiversified risks in their own banks or their bank's own stock. Um, I can well imagine that these investors shy away from financial decisions because of this. And, and in fact, we also find that the largest active reduction in risk-taking in the future comes specifically from avoiding stocks in the banking and financial sector. So that kind of suggests that, that there might be some mistaste for, for, uh, for finance. And do you think people who might get burned investing in crypto will see a similar effect? Yeah, I think I've been thinking a lot about this and, and I think it's likely, um, I don't know any, any like, um, academic studies on this, but, but anecdotally, I do know many who got involved with crypto towards, you know, mid to end of 2017, we had this big price run up for Bitcoin and, you know, and these were relatively young novice investors who invested relatively heavy into a very wide spectrum of various coins, many which surely don't exist anymore. Um, and I, I, I mean, I can, I know of several who, who lost quite a bit and stepped fully away from crypto assets. I mean, on one hand, making these types of experiences at a young age may be important for building up better habits in the future, right? So if you lose a little bit early on, maybe that saves you from making a much bigger mistake later on. I don't know. As long as you adequately like learn from these experiences, right? On the other hand, experiencing a large loss uh, later in life could be very detrimental and, and it could be a very large risk if investors, you know, what they take away from this experience is that they should mistrust finance completely and, uh, you know, non you know, and stop participating because, you know, the, that future cost of non-participation is going to compound these experience losses. So, um, I, I mean, just to get back to the question, I think, I think it's definitely possible. Um, my hope is that that uh, the crypto investors are at least a bit younger and, and maybe will learn from it for the future. Uh, whereas opposed to the Danish setting where um, I think a lot of our households and, and sample investors were a bit older and this was like um, kind of serious long-term savings that, that they were losing. Uh, hmm. It, I know we're just kind of speculating at this point, but uh, it, it's it's super interesting to think about. In, in your sample, the investors shied away specifically from investing in in bank stocks, 
um, in the crypto scenario, if they get scared off of investing in crypto, but not not other financial markets, um, maybe that's maybe that's not so, such a big loss. But if they get scared off of investing in general, then it's a it's a big loss. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe it's it's not a bad thing at all if they they kind of they learn that cryptocurrencies are are maybe not where they should be first investing, and maybe that's only a small fraction of their portfolio, and so on and so forth. But um, but yeah, it's 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 an empirical question, I think. Right. So you gathered this data in Denmark. Ben and I are in Canada. Is there any reason that all these findings wouldn't apply to other markets or parts of the world? Uh, I mean, I think the experience effects would definitely apply broadly. Um, I mean, there's plenty of studies. For, I mean, there's studies from Finland. There's studies from Germany. There's studies from the United States on these types of experience effects. And I, I can't imagine a scenario where one group of investors um, would basically make this make these types of experiences and then, you know, either not react to them or react in a perfectly, uh, you know, efficient way. I, I, I mean, I, I think that this is basically in, or inherently a, a feature of, of human behavior that um, many people are, are going to experience a shock and, and, and unfortunately shy away from risk a little bit, at least in the, in the short term following those events. What's the more theoretically appropriate response to losing money in a concentrated investment like like the bank stocks in your sample? Yeah, I mean, I, it would be ideal if investors learn from this from their mistakes and rather than hold concentrated portfolios and and then shy away from risk, they actually say, "Well, I should diversify." And uh, you know, it would have been would have been fantastic to see investors with stronger experiences then heavily tilt towards passive ETFs, but, you know, unfortunately that's, that's just not what we're observing. Hmm. I, I want to come back quickly to the disposition effect paper. Yep. Are, are there, what, what are the lessons when we're talking about crypto specifically in this kind of highly volatile market from the findings in the disposition effect paper? Are, are there takeaways that you, you think are important for crypto investors specifically? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, so I think this is a very, this is a very new area. So because of the data availability, we, we don't know much about, um, you know, how individuals are actually trading uh, cryptocurrencies. And I, I mean, I think my guess is that we would find a lot of similarities in terms of biases and in terms of the disposition effect. But it's, it's really an empirical question and we haven't been able to open this black box you know in our mm -hmm. setting from the german data on indirect investments we have really a pretty limited time series so i can't i can't really observe people that are holding losses and uh you know not realizing them and so on and so forth but i, I my guess is that we would find a lot of similarities between um you know the biases investors make on on single stocks and and equities as the ones that they would in in cryptocurrencies in terms of the disposition effect i mean the disposition effect is is very well documented and it's something that comes up in all different types of asset markets we see them in in funds in stocks in real estate even in art markets and so on and so forth so i can't imagine um, cryptocurrencies would be immune to them. In fact, I think they're probably even stronger when you think about like the movements of investors, you know, holding Bitcoin and so on and so forth, because they they are hoping for um, you know very high returns in in the long run. So, I mean, so that being said, I, I think it's very much an expectations and belief story rather than than a risk story i mean and that would be you know that's probably how i would like link these two themes mm. that's kind of where my question was coming from is like you found this relationship between the ex the returns that investors expect when they buy an investment and the disposition effect and then anecdotally from people that i know investing in crypto they are expecting exceptionally high returns which is one of the main reasons they're investing in the asset class yeah yeah exactly yep. 
Cool. All right. Well, Tobin, this has been fantastic. It was it was great to talk about your your paper on crypto investors, but these other two papers uh, also, I think, add a lot to the discussion. So we, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate that you guys had me on and it's been uh, it's been great. So thank you. Yeah, Tobin, great to meet you. Great insights. And thanks everybody out there for listening. Mm-hmm.